Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Praise the Lord. It is my honor and privilege to share the pulpit with Pastor Ryan on a series that we're going to begin today that I will be doing the first two weeks and then Pastor Ryan will take over. But this is a series called Rut to Revival. From Rut to Revival, it is time, especially in the dark age that we are living in, that we are able to turn our ruts and anything that we go through into revival. Amen? So we're going to be talking about that today. So I want to just ask you several questions here. How many of us have been in ruts, difficulties, hardships, or situations in life that seem like the grip it has will never be broken? How many of us have attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and thoughts that seem to be rooted in negativity? None of you are negative, right? (laughs) Nobody here. That's just in case you have a friend that uh, might be. How many of us seem to stay stuck in depression, anxiety, anger, discouragement, unforgiveness, fear, or any other negative emotional experience? How many of us can't seem to get away from destructive habits, bad relationships, conflict with others, destructive decision-making, or life choices that don't seem to work out? How many of you had any of those things? And if you're like me, I'm raising my hand, all right? Because we all can fit into those categories. But God is with us, right? We all need to turn our ruts in life into revival so that God can be fully realized in any and every circumstance we face in our lives. So if you answered yes to any of those four questions or maybe all four, this series is for you. And we want to turn your rut into a revival. Now I know that the ruts don't go away. I mean, you know, there's potholes in roads sometimes, especially when we use them quite frequently. But God is with us in those ruts. And that's the message that we want to really portray to you, is that it doesn't matter what you face. God will always, always be running after you. I love the Lord. But some of us don't see it, okay? That's okay. But what we want to do and hope to do at the end of the series is be able to open your eyes to how to handle the ruts that you have or anything that you're going to go through so that God, God is with you. So let me add, uh, define what a rut is, all right? Um, the definition is going to be up, um, maybe up for a little bit, but if you miss it, we're going to have these notes online uh, with the sermon, uh, after sermon series, right? After sermon, I don't know what it's called, but okay. So what is a rut? Any habitual pattern, persistent mindset, emotional stalemate, or comfortable position in life that robs us of the ability to move forward into God's best for victory and freedom in any area of our lives. Folks, there's a lot that happens in our lives, right? There's a lot of things that can happen. You may have habitual patterns, addictions, things that just seem to rotate over and over again. There may be a persistent mindset that just seems to invade and causes us to be negative. There may be an emotional stalemate where you just can't seem to get out of depression or anxiety or anger. And there may be comfortable positions. We're just comfortable where we are. I got to tell you something. Christianity is not a spectator sport. You already know that, right? You have to participate. And if you're in a comfortable position and you're staying stuck where you are, that is not what God wants for you. And that's what we're hoping to communicate. So now that I've depressed you, because ruts come in all shapes and sizes. Some have been there for a long time. Some are just for a short time. Some are big and some are small. It's just like that. A rut can be a flat tire that you might have on the highway, or it can be a destructive habit or a pattern of abuse that you have sustained throughout your life. So ruts are, you know, what we're doing is we're just covering an awful lot of things. 
when we talk about a rut. So I do not want you to think that we're minimizing what you're going through because I know some of you are going through things that you wouldn't call a rut. You would call destructiveness in your lives. There is trauma. There are things that God wants to touch and wants to heal in your lives. Amen? So when you're depressed now, now I want to tell you the good news, all right? The good news is God is always with us. He is always chasing after us. I love that song. No matter what you feel and no matter what you see, you may not feel the presence of God, but I guarantee you he is always there with you in anything that you face. Secondly, his power can deliver us. His power can deliver us. I love what Paul said in Philippians 3.10. In the first part of 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. You see, the neat thing about this series is we want to connect Easter and we want to connect the commitments that we made throughout Easter and throughout the play, The Rock, and we want to be able to say to you that there is a journey that you're going to take now. There are there's things that you're going to do that are going to help you to grow in the Lord. And if you've even been in the Lord for a long time, God still wants you to not be discouraged and that you keep pushing going on because the power of the resurrection is resident within you. What Jesus, what you saw depicted, the power that rose Jesus from the dead is resident in all of us. The enemy wants to tell you it's not, but it is. So his power can deliver us. I can do all things, right? I can do all things through myself. See, you're starting to catch on because you're reacting way too fast. You kind of know what I do sometimes. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You're not going to have the strength yourself sometimes to face life. And it is Christ that has to give you that strength. But it is him in you that has to give you that strength. You can't face it on your own. And sometimes we try to do that. I try to do that. There are things in my life that sometimes I'm like, well, I don't need God in this or that, you know. And it's like he just simply reminds us, no, you need me. And so it becomes a lifestyle. It has to become a change. In our lives. And finally, God knows what He wants to do in us and through us. And it's really a hard thing to give yourself to the Lord's will, right? Because sometimes He doesn't do what we expect Him to do. So let's look at the Israelites. I want to kind of take a journey uh, to the Israelites that are in Egypt and God's ability to deliver them and how (laughs) the Israelites struggle along the way. How many of you know God can deliver you, but sometimes we still complain? God can be with us, and we're still complaining about things, okay? So we're going to take a look at the Israelites. Now, they were in their homeland of Canaan, and then Joseph was sold into slavery, but a famine was to come, and God had a bigger plan. And Joseph was, eventually became in charge of saving the nation. Jacob and the Israelites then went to Egypt. All of the Israelites went down to Egypt because of the famine, and they settled there. But eventually what happened is a new generation came that Joseph was not involved with and a new king appeared. And so we start the journey here in Exodus chapter 1, starting in verses 6 to 10. It says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. I mean, this was oppression on steroids. The entire nation was crying out to God. The oppression and the bondage lasted many years. But God heard their cry. And here comes Moses. Moses and the burning bush. This is where God spoke to him. And he said these words in Exodus 3, verses 7 to 10. He says, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. I love the New Living Translation. God is aware 
of your suffering. How many of you believe that? How many of you doubt that sometimes? But I got to tell you, no matter what you feel, God is aware of your sufferings. Now, he may have a kind of unique way to bring us out, but listen to me carefully. And what we're really going to do here in the punchline is that God is actually wanting to be a part of your journey. And we're going to look at that here. He is aware, but he still has a plan. Okay? So I have come down to, verse 8, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt, and listen to these words, into their own fertile and spacious land. They already owned it. They were already there. What is God doing? It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, the Smyrnaites, and the Doverites now live. <laughs> Everybody you have this, all those ites, right? Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. And so he went to Pharaoh, and guess what? It failed. See, they were in a big rut. And here comes Moses. He's excited. God's going to, I'm going to go to Pharaoh. I'm going to go to the king. Let my people go. And he doesn't. In fact, he ups the ante. There was an increase in the oppression. So Moses was frustrated and God comes back later with the same promise. It's like, this is so fascinating to me. Sometimes we can be so discouraged because God, you know, there's a promise, but it doesn't seem to work out for us. And then all of a sudden, God comes back to us, and he reminds us again what he's going to do. I am saying to you today, do not get lost in what is happening to you, because God is always there with you, and he will always carry you through. Even when things don't go right. And, and Moses got to be frustrated in the people. And so here it is. God's coming back to them a second time. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Wow. Now, all the people, the Bible says, rejoiced after that, right? Verse 9 is such a powerful verse to me. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor, or cruel bondage in one of the NIVs. They did not listen to him. Why? They had been in, you want to talk about a rut? The promise came. They got excited. Pharaoh didn't let his people go. Then they had to face more discouragement. But the good news is this. God's not limited by our discouragement. He's not limited by what we think. He doesn't sit there and say, well, I'm sorry, you're depressed and you're not listening to me. I am not going to do what I promised to do. Now, it may feel that way, but I have to tell you, and the enemy you have to reject when in your mind you start thinking God's not with you because he still works a plan. Amen? Even in spite of their discouragement, God still came. And you know the ten plagues which led to the Passover and that God Israel out of Egypt. The Bible says that they were in Egypt for 430 years. But God cared about what they experienced, and he led them. And look at the fact that Israelites were ready for battle. So we go to them, he gets out of Egypt, and he gives them a journey, and he's on the way. And that is in Exodus 13, verses 17 to 18, says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. You know, God cares, right? But look at verse 18. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up to Egypt ready for battle. They were excited. Finally, we've gotten out of bondage. We, you know, we're, now we're, we're headed in a certain direction, but all of a sudden, you kind of walk across, and there is a great ocean, a great body of water there. 
And the question is, uh oh, how are we going to get past that? Okay. Verse 20 of that chapter says, after leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham in the edge of the desert by the day. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on the way, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day and night. Neither the cloud of, pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God was leading them. But God had a different plan. So he's leading them to the Red Sea. How many of us need, think that sometimes God needs some help, you know? Uh, need some help with your logic here. He's given them freedom, and all of a sudden, there are mountains on either side, and right now, they're in front of Rehoboth Beach, and they can't cross the Atlantic. Imagine, just imagine that for a minute. And the Egyptians are chasing him. You know why? Because God let him do it. Boy, I'll tell you what, you know, isn't it something that God can actually cause the enemy to chase us because he wants to do something with the enemy too? Amen? All right. So it says in Exodus 14, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians, uh uh-oh, marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, listen to this, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They stopped believing. Because of the great obstacle, because of the rut that they were in, they stopped believing in God. You know, God brought them to this place on purpose. And sometimes does God bring you to place on purpose? Maybe he sees something in you that he wants to get rid of, and so he might squeeze you a little bit. But I will guarantee you, God will get the glory. God always gets the glory. Amen? He always gets the glory. But God was not phased by the complaint. He knew what he was going to do, and they didn't. Sometimes we just don't know what God's going to do, but do we have the faith to believe that he's going to do something? Look at Exodus 14, verses 15 and 16. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? <laughs> Yeah. You know, this is the bot. They're, they're at the ocean, a great sea, a great body of water, an obstacle in their way. And God is saying to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. We sometimes don't understand what God is going to do. When you have an obstacle in your life, isn't it, isn't it true that you may not know what to do, but you have to stay firm? It sort of reminds me of Jehoshaphat, who had those vast armies coming against them, and he says to God, we have no power to face this vast army that's coming against us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And God said this to them. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It is God that takes care of the enemy. It is God that leads us. And if you feel like sometimes you're coming into your journey and then all of a sudden there's an obstacle in the way, that's not an obstacle God can't handle. It's an obstacle we will understand as discouragement. It is an obstacle that we will get angry about. It is an obstacle that the enemy will tell you God does not care. But I am here to tell you right now that any obstacle you face, if you stretch out your staff and you move on in life, that God is the one that parts the waters. Amen? God wanted them on dry ground. You're, taking, you're talking about 600,000 men plus women plus children, and the Bible says many other people because some of the Egyptians came along. There was, this, is, this is about 2 million if we look at it. Then you don't count the sheep, the goats, the, the, all of the sacrificial uh, animals and, and all those things on dry ground. And God just parted the waters. 
and he used this great big giant hair dryer. <laughs> and he dried the bottom of the ocean so that that many people can go through that night. Isn't that fascinating? They didn't see it. I don't know what you would have experienced if you're sitting there and you're kind of discouraged because you have this, this bondage mentality and all of a sudden, oh, God wants us to go through. He opens the way somehow, okay? Look at verse 19 and 20 of Exodus 14. To me, this, is, this gives me goosebumps too. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew. See, this is, this is the angel traveling in the front, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud that was in front of them also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. In other words, they didn't have to be afraid of the Egyptians because God took his forces that were leading them and went behind them and they were able to trust that God was going to protect them when they went through it. Amen. So had all that stuff, they came through the Red Sea, God swallowed up the Egyptians. Major victory. You would think that they would be happy but they were human. They struggled as they went forward in spite of what God was doing to lead them. You see, the old nature keeps sabotaging our efforts to be content with what God is doing and where God is bringing us. They eventually arrived at the, at the, at the promised land. This is the promised land, okay? Several months later, I don't know how long it took. I tried to figure that one out, and everybody's got a different answer on that one. But they, they finally arrive at the promised land. The land God promised them, they send out 12 spies. They come back. Ten of them give a bad report. Now, we've talked to, I've talked about this, but it's one of my favorite stories. Because it is really, 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 really powerful to me that two million plus people can be affected by ten spies. To give a bad report when God has already done what he has done. Folks, sometimes we need to look back to see God's faithfulness, right? Because we don't know where he's taken us. But sometimes I have to hold on to the victories that he has given us and having the faith to be able to say, I know God is going to bring me no matter how it looks. He's going to bring me through. He's going to help me through. So it is time to stop listening to everybody else. Stop listening to other theologies that don't quite mix with God. Stop believing what the world is saying. Stop believing what the world is saying about what is happening in our world. And start believing what God is going to do to bring us through and to keep us strong and to bring us and to impart any obstacle that's going to come our way. The Israelites were affected by the bad report and failed and sad outcome is seen here in Deuteronomy 1. Now God is kind of recapping with Moses what happened and, and his disappointment. He says this, But you were unwilling to go up, and you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us, so he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us in the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Listen to what God is looking at here. It's like they were accusing God of bringing them out just to be defeated. That's what the enemy does. He wants to convince you that God has bad motives and he doesn't deliver. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, and this is good for us too, then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you. It doesn't matter what the land looks like. It doesn't matter where we're going. God will defeat every obstacle that comes your way. Any rut that you can face, God is bigger than it. He will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. Then you saw how the Lord your God carried you. And I love this, as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. The goodness of God is chasing after us. 
He's carrying us as children. But look at this, thirty-two, verse 32. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. I am in trouble time-wise here. We're going we're gonna to move, all right? Two takeaways. Well, actually, three takeaways that we're just going to close on. One of them we're going to do next week, okay? Because I didn't have enough time to do these right now. Takeaway number one, it gives me goosebumps when I realize this, but God always brings us home. He always brings us home. He always brings us to victory. You look at what it started with Abram when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he, they, God brought him to the land of Canaan, and he, wanted, he wanted, went to Egypt because of a famine. Then he went back to Canaan, and there were several times in Genesis where the Israelites left, but God brought them back. Then they went to Egypt in this particular story. But God released them from the Egyptians. Where was he taking them? Where was he taking them? Where was he taking them? He was taking them back home where they were already supposed to be. The promised land was already theirs. You see, Jesus came to restore us. He came to bring us home. And here we are celebrating Easter. And we have the Passover lamb, just like the Passover brought them out of Egypt. The Passover lamb who was crucified on the cross with the power of the resurrection. He delivered us and he brought us right before God because the curtain in the temple was torn in two. And now we have the Holy of Holies within us as God gives us the Holy Spirit. He has brought us home. I just love that. And then, of course, we have... The, uh, the ultimate home, from Genesis to Revelation, I, listen, the best thing you can do, I've said this, I said it, and I will say it every time I'm up here. When I read the chronological Bible, I understood the love of God. From Genesis to Revelation, and understood it more. But you know what God is trying to do? He's trying to destroy what happened in the Garden of Eden. And if you look at Revelation, he's bringing us back home. He is saying there is a new heaven and a new earth coming. This is not our home. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And God is bringing us home. And that is so the, the love of God. And so in your journey, he will always bring us home, which brings us to the second and last takeaway. The journey, and this is careful, this is carefully to this, the journey is just as important as a destination. The journey is just as important as the destination. Note that the promised land did not border Egypt. And I love that. It's like God wanted them to go somewhere. Why? Because he knew that they would not be able to inherit whatever it is that they were given. And sometimes the journey that we take is a way that God begins to strengthen us and help us to become stronger, to take captive the promised land. It is sad that the Israelites couldn't do it. That generation that met right to the promised land had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. I don't want anybody in this room to wander for 40 seconds. I want us to believe that God is with you, and no matter what you feel, no matter what you face, and no matter what you see, God is going to continue to deliver us, and we can be in revival even if we're in our ruts. And we're going to spit in the enemy's face, and we're going to say, the Lord is greater than anything I'm going to face. When the enemy tells you different. You remind him of where God's taking you. He's taking you on a journey. Consider this. This is, this is fascinating. No Israelite knew freedom. They were all in bondage. But this is what struck me, and I hadn't thought about this before. They had generations that did not know freedom. So they didn't know freedom. 430 years, right? They didn't know freedom. Their parents didn't know freedom. Their grandparents didn't know freedom. No wonder something gets stuck. We, become men we have the victim mentality. We have the bondage mentality within us. Whatever it is or when you came to Christ, something's in you. And even if you're a believer, something is in you that drives you to go away from God. And God wants to deliver us from that. 
God had to make something new. Can you imagine? What they were experiencing was totally new. They didn't understand God. They didn't understand his purpose. So my assumption is this. The journey was a way for God to shape them with his experiences and prepare them to physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually take control of what God had for them. Even at the doorstep to freedom and promise, they sabotaged their ability to take possession of it. Because they fail to understand that in the journey, we need to grow. In the journey, we need to see God rights. But their mentality, whatever was controlling them, was keeping them from freedom and victory. But God wants to bring us home. So the journey for us strengthens us, perfects us, prepares us, changes us, so that our destination can be fully realized. And I want to I demonstrate this by playing you a song. I'm going to sing you a song. All right. What song am I going to sing? Does anybody know what these white keys are for? <laughs> There's an awful lot of buttons. I'm kind of intimidated. I don't know how Shana does it. But those of you who know me, I have absolutely nil musical attributes. It's not my gifting, right? but I can't just do it. I can envy Shana for being there. But what did Shana have to do to get there? She had to journey. She had to learn. She had to practice. Everything was there. And isn't that the way life is? Folks, we're on a journey. If you want a college degree and you're saying, that's my destination, the journey is to take the classes, to do the work, to, to pass the tests, to do the papers. If you want to be an athlete, by the way, I don't have any athletic efficiency anyway, but I do envy people that can actually do it really well, like in the, the pros. But how did they get there? They had to make a journey. They had to acquire the skills. They had to practice. They had the experience. If you're raising a child to become an adult, how many of you know it doesn't happen automatically? There's a journey that happens as the child grows from zero to 18, and sometimes that journey can be bumpy and have an awful lot of obstacles to it. And sometimes we can learn a lot from our kids, right? Amen. So if you want to be spiritually mature, that's your goal. I want to be like Pastor Ryan. How many want to be like him? I'm just kidding. Just attain. You know, because sometimes we can envy where people are spiritually. But guess where we, what we had to do? We had to take a journey. Every single one of us has to take a journey. And when you focus too much on the destination and you don't understand that God wants to shape us on the journey, we get into trouble. Amen? How much are we impatient with God as he leads us on our journey to healing, wholeness, growth, freedom, spirituality, whatever it is? But when we, our focus is too much on the destination, we can experience discouragement, confusion, disillusionment, anger, regret, drifting back to the old culture and the old nature. If we focus too much on that, I could say, I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to be healed. And that's the destination. But what if God wants you to go through a journey to get there? Because if we go through, if we focus on the journey with our eye on the destination, Go through the journey. We can realize God's faithfulness, his provision, his strength, his healing, his constant presence, his plan and purpose for our lives. God's goodness is chasing after us. So I want to bring this into reality with my own story of a one rut. Oh, I, 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 I did. I looked in my drawer. I have lots of ruts. You know? Sometimes, you know, I don't know if you know my history, but I came from a home that we didn't have much. We didn't have much provision. Sometimes I just had to make an onion sandwich. Or when we went to school, my mom, I remember this, would pack a bologna sandwich. You know how she made a bologna sandwich? She would put one piece of bologna, no cheese. That's probably why I love cheese today. She would put mustard on the bread 
and then she scrape off the excess and put it back in the jar. That's how bad it was. We as kids, we had some issues here because we didn't have enough to eat. So, you know, if there's anything left over, I'm the garbage can. It is fascinating. I've never shared this with anybody else but Dorothy or Pastor Ryan. I have what I call portion anxiety. I'm always wondering if I'm going to be full enough before a meal. I have anxiety that there isn't going to be enough. And it showed up at Grotto's on Friday night. It is such a fascinating thing. I'm sitting at Grotto's and I'm trying to order something and all of a sudden, I'm anxious. For years, I'm anxious. I'm wondering if I'm going to order enough. If, am I going to be satisfied? That's crazy. That came from my childhood 25 years ago. Oh, plus one and a half, right? What amazes me is that things can get stuck in us. I have things inside of me, insecurities. I can take things the wrong way real easy. I mean, there are times sometimes my granddaughter, Kenzie, can say something and she doesn't even know. It's the heart. But she can be used of God to bring something out. It's the journey, folks. It's going to expose you to things that you have had in your minds, in your hearts. You're going to have ruts that are going to be exposed. Are you ready to change that? Are you? No, listen. Well, I'm going to share that in a minute after Aurea sings. So I want us to stand. The bottom line of what we're talking about here is that the journey is God's way to grow us as we progress through life. It is God's way to heal and transform us from the wounds we already have experienced. It is God's way to remove the stain of the effects of years stuck in the old nature and in the flesh that exists in us. It is God's way to be glorified as he provides for us and changes our dependence on this world. It is God's way of guiding us through the difficult parts of our lives. It is God's way to help us to grow spiritually and rely on him more and more for direction in our lives. It is a process by which he helps us to be transformed into his image as we become perfected in our characters and in our walk with him through life. But folks, it is God's way to help us to get to the destinations in our life and ultimately the final destination, eternity. God wants us home. But he has us on a journey. He has us on a journey. And we want to take this moment to pray for you. Ori is going to sing a song, which I think is completely appropriate for this situation and for this series. If you have a rut, you have something that's in your lives, you have a habit, you have an emotion, you have a thought process, a persistent mindset, you are comfortable in life, and you need God to shake your world and bring you through it, then we want you to come to the altar as she sings. Don't be afraid because God wants to touch you. I really do believe that. So as Aurea sings, come forward. If you have some rut, you can just drop it here. And we're inviting God into that space in your life. All right. Now that's interesting because I didn't necessarily mean to applaud. Are we comfortable just letting God praise him in whatever situation we're in? Can we clap when we're in the most difficult of situations? When the darkness is there, he is there. He leads us, he guides us, he protects us on all sides because the Holy Spirit is in us. And there was something at nine o'clock service that I was wrestling with with God. And he wanted me to say this because I think this is so true where a lot of people can get confused because somebody can tell you, well, just go to the altar and let it go. 
How many of you know God can heal instantly? God can deliver instantly, right? Now I have this out recorded, so you can't deny this, that I believe this. But there are many, many times where he wants to lead us through something. You don't get discouraged because God hasn't completely delivered you. That's focusing on the destination. When God wants us to be on the journey, the journey of healing, the journey of deliverance, the journey of allowing our spiritual lives to grow beyond what is going on in our own lives, to take our focus off of what we've experienced in our past and to look at what we need today. It is releasing depression. It is releasing anxiety. It is releasing anger and unforgiveness. It is a restoring of relationships. But the most important relationship is to be with him. Right now, as he parts your sea and you go through on dry ground, you have to envision that. We're not trying to make this emotional. We just want you to be real. We want God to be real in your lives. Don't, don't listen to the enemy. And sometimes we do. Amen? It is a process. Sometimes I get discouraged because I don't know why God is, I'm, I'm still going through certain things. Why does the insecurity come back? Why is it that Dorothy can say something that crushes my heart? And she didn't even intend to do it. But God is squeezing us, isn't he? It's time to look to him, not to our spouse. It's time to look to him, not to our circumstances. Don't look at the sea. God says, I care for you, but stretch out your staff. Amen? All right, we're going to pray because we're going to get yelled at for being here too long. But God wants to do something here. It's a partly a releasing to God what you're going through you're going to probably walk away with it still in your heart. But God is there to continue you on the journey. Amen? Don't give up because something hasn't happened. I, I hear it a lot. You know, where people say, I prayed and I fasted and I did this and God hasn't shown up. And the word I always say to those who have said that to me is, yet. He hasn't done it yet, but God is faithful. He's doing something in your life. Next week, we're going to look at the enemies and why it's important that the enemies were in the land for them to get into. You have to fight something. There's a fight. And we're going to talk about that in the third takeaway. So let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we're just thankful that we can experience you. This is, this is a journey that we are going to take, Lord. And then on this journey, there can be instant healing. There can be instant deliverance. But most of the times, Lord, you want us to walk through. It's sort of like what you said to the man in the pool of Bethesda, crippled for 37 years. And you simply ask the question, do you want to get well? What you were doing is if you were to deliver him, he is not to live in the mentality of his crippleness anymore. He is to come out of that. And Lord, the Egyptians have really pulled the bondage and the mentality on the Israelites, but God calls them out. And he led them on a journey, hopefully to try to perfect them on the way. May we not fail to see you in every obstacle that we face. So Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the patience of your people to be here this long. Because you have something to say. And we honor you today. We're grateful. Now go with us on our journeys. Bring us home. Bring us towards victory. And help us not focus on what we feel right now. What we think right now. What position we're in right now. What addiction we may be having right now. You're going to strengthen us in the way. We honor you today and thank you. Be with us the remainder of this day and this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't God good?